Welcome to Animals Voice Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin McKenzie, and uh, very excited to be joined today by Bob Joseph. How are you, Bob? I'm excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks for bringing us in. Yeah, happy to have you here. Bob, you are the founder and president of Indigenous Corporate Training, Inc. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be talking to Bob today about a number of things. The relationship between Indigenous peoples and animals and working with communities across Ontario. Um, So I I guess let's get right into the the interview. What was your background before you founded Indigenous Corporate Training, Inc.? Well, how far do you want me to go back? I can Right at birth. Okay, good. Let's start there. So anyways, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) No, I, I, uh, my, um, my career really as a trainer started at uh, BC Hydro way back in 1994. Although I joined the corporation before that, not to be a trainer, I, I actually joined to work on human resources and advertising and display and customer services, talking to that happy 2% of our customers uh, <laughs> that you know wanted to talk about their bills. But uh, in 1994, I bumped into a manager for Aboriginal relations outside of some elevators and we talked briefly and she said, would you be interested in putting on presentations for the employees, which I agreed to do. And Sounds like there was an elevator pitch right outside it, an elevator. It was an Go elevator figure. pitch. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 uh, it was uh, very uh, serendipitous and lucky, and it really changed my whole life. So that was in 94? Yeah. So you started doing some training, yeah. but under the, the BC Hydro yeah. Uh, umbrella? Yeah, so it was just for hydro people. Okay. And, um, you know, uh, before, before I'd left in 2002, we talked to over 4,700 hydro employees across the system, but we began to be benchmarked. And this was the really neat thing. Sometimes when you're working with First Nations, Inuit, Métis communities, Mm -hmm. you don't have the luxury of just working there yourself. And so we were at a meeting with some other companies. And after the meeting, some of the other companies called us up. Hey, can we come and talk to you about that meeting we were just at? And so we invited them to our office. They showed up. The first thing they said was, so we were just at the same meeting. And we're wondering why the hydro people weren't getting beat up as much. And so we started to talk about our whole Aboriginal relations strategy, just one component of which was training for employees. Okay. And uh, as soon as we finished talking, they said, would you train our people? And so as a hydro person, I'm training people for other companies. And Mm -hmm. before I leave in 2002, uh, we talked to over 100 outside organizations across British Columbia and Canada. We've got a USA version. I've been to Peru, Guatemala, New Caledonia, and the South Pacific. Turns out wherever there's colonized indigenous peoples. The history can be different, but the tools, techniques, hints, tips can all be uh, very similar as you go from culture to culture. So. So, what, so what would you say led you? You said, you, so you founded Indigenous Corporate Training Inc. in 2002? Yeah. So yeah. what led you to, like, was you had an epiphany that yeah, you needed yeah. to create well, this? Well, just realized that there was just such a big need there that people were interested in it. And so, uh, you know, at Hydro, I was doing Aboriginal awareness, which really was just sort of uh, creating an, an awareness. But I thought, you know, the, the sort of next level and what was starting to happen just a little bit was... Um, how do okay so now that i'm aware how do i do it how do i how do i make it practical when i'm working with people is I, and so after after that i really dedicated you know the rest of my career to this day to uh the thing that we've been working on we call it working effectively with indigenous people so mm-hmm. we start off people with like an awareness piece and then uh and then we move it to some of like say the practical hints and tips and then uh, from there, we branched out into helping people do consultation and engagement. We've helped people. <coughs> Excuse me. We've helped people uh, put together engagement plans, and you know, just just uh, how to negotiate with indigenous people. So it sort of has uh, branched out, and and we train all, you know all levels of government. Mm-hmm. You know, and honestly, one of the one of the things I'm really proud of is when people ask me, "Who do you train?" Like I'm in a taxi cab or an airplane. Yeah. I say I train everybody from. The Ontario SPCA to you know the Department of Justice and at the federal government, so it's really quite a range. Very unique yeah. uh, building relationships with Indigenous yeah. communities. Can you give me a glimpse into what that is like? I mean, are there certain steps that you need to take place when you commence building that relationship? For sure, for sure. So um, we have a book called Working Effectively with Indigenous Peoples. Our courses have this too. But uh, one of the things I'm a really big advocate of is that people actually do a little bit of research research before they go. So we actually put together this uh, mnemonic, which stands for its respect. So we want to do a little bit of research. We want to evaluate. We want to make sure we have a good strategy. 
in the presentation piece, we actually talk about eye contact, handshaking, pace of communications, how to do protocol. Right. And I uh, mean, respect has got to be yeah. such a huge part of that introduction and the building of rapport. Yeah, right? it is. And most people actually aren't going in to be disrespectful. That's a neat thing. Right. They're all going in to be respectful, but they don't but realize... But there's a right way and a wrong way to yeah, do it. Yeah, they don't realize that some of the things they do normally would be really upsetting to Indigenous people. So very common for somebody to go in and say, hi, we're here to talk to you because you're a stakeholder in our list. And, you know, just if you call them stakeholders, they just get really upset. And it's not that they're being disrespectful. They just don't know what not to say. Right. And so a lot of time I spend with people will be helping them with what not to say. Yeah. Etiquette. Yeah. Etiquette. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, I have a, I have a blog. We get over 70,000 visitors a month. It's, you know, since we started in mid 2014, 1.2 million visitors and we have some free eBooks, 23 things to not say and do and 27 things to say and do. And I can tell you the one of not say and do, just outperforms the 27 things to do and they're just both free little ebooks of practical advice but the numbers you know like almost 10,000 downloads of 23 things to not say and mm -hmm. uh, you know 1200 of 27 things to say so it's kind of a that seems to be what people are interested in when they come to us I just want to make sure I don't say the wrong thing right and right working with people so and interesting yeah, yeah. Well, listen I, I want to take a quick commercial break uh, when we get back I want to talk to you specifically specifically about um, animal welfare and some of some of uh, the areas that touch on the industry that the Ontario SPCA is involved in uh, when we come right back with Bob Joseph on Animals Voice Podcast. Welcome back on Animals Voice Podcast. We're still with Bob Joseph, the founder uh, and president of Indigenous Corporate Training, Inc. Bob, we uh, talked about before the break some of the work you do in building relationships and teaching others about etiquette in building uh, relationships within Indigenous communities. I want to talk a little bit now about Indigenous perspectives on animals and animal protection. I mean, do you get involved in, in that? Do you see that a lot? Yeah, yeah. Well, we're always involved, you know, in, in the work that I do and trying to help people see across cultures. And, right. And I always tell people, look, I'm not going to try and convince you of what's right or not right or fair or not fair, but I'll, I will let you see how other people see the same thing and actually try to try to find you some wiggle room in your work with uh, peoples and communities. So, you know, it, it, this would fall right into the realm and just trying to share some perspective. So in, in terms of animal welfare and care and, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff and the connection to animals uh, spiritually, if I think about where I come from, and actually before I, I share the answer with you, I should just let you know, the, the viewers know that there's actually over 605 different communities. They fall underneath 11 major language families, which are as different as Spanish is to Japanese wow. and are broken up into over 50 dialects. So for, for me to actually say I'm speaking for First Nations, it's like, uh, yeah, it'd be it's like impossible a, for you yeah, to claim. I know what like, you're saying. It'd be like asking the chancellor of Germany to, do you speak on behalf of Europeans? So yeah, I can, I, I can definitely give you some perspective that way. Uh, so where I come from, I come from, uh, northeast Vancouver Island and the adjacent mainland, there's a group of people that are called the Kwakwakiwak. And we, um, our territory is from Comox to Port Hardy and then the adjacent mainland and the Broughton Archipelago. And uh, we, we have... Um, uh, a big interest in animals. If I think about our creation story, the Gwawain tribe where I'm from, uh, Thunderbird landed on top of a mountain called Mount Stevens, transformed into a human shape and becomes the first ancestor of the Gwawain tribe. In my mum's village, Kinkam Inlet, the Tsaodenoch, um, they would talk to you about two wolves at the dawn of time. Uh, you, if you look on the back of the old $20 bill, if viewers look on the back of the old $20 bill, you see people and creatures crawling out of a clamshell, animals, and you see the raven on top. And and uh, so what we what we find is this, uh, this connection that a lot of times will go back to uh, very important events. The Thunderbird landed on top of the mountain 
Mount Stevens, so that's like our family crest. And uh, But throughout the uh, Kwakwakiwak tribes, wolves, bears, killer whales, thunderbirds, eagles, all of that stuff is right at the, uh, the center of our cultural, spiritual beliefs. In fact, my uh, traditional name, which was given to me in a potlatch way back in the early 1980s, uh, is Aksumnakwala and Aksumnakwala literally means a point in time when the killer whale breaches the surface. You see the dorsal fin, that first shot of air that comes out of the, you know, out of the out of the blowhole. I guess that's what you call that. Uh, and uh, the name, because my my dad's a hereditary chief of the Kwakwakiwak, um, it literally translates to returning chief. So we have this reverence for killer whales and wolves and you know, thunderbirds and eagles, and, and they're, they're just, I don't even know how to really describe it, but it's very central to our whole belief it's, system. It sounds that way, and, mm. and uh, a history that is rich with animal involvement. Yeah. So tell me, uh, how does that perspective impact the role of an outside organization like the Ontario SPCA? Yeah. Because we, in the eyes of the Indigenous peoples that you were just talking about, Mm-hmm are an organization that's been around for the blink of an eye. Yeah. yeah Whereas you, <laughs> you have just described to me a rich history back to the inception mm-hmm, of, mm-hmm. Of, of the, the peoples that you were describing. So yeah. what's that, per, what's the perspective within your community, those communities <clears throat> of an outside organization like the Ontario SPCA? Yeah. So, you know, we, uh, obviously we would care about animals. We would love animals. We would, uh, revere them spiritually. I mean, when we talk about the, uh, the Thunderbird crest, we would, we would fight over that crest like Coca-Cola would defend its logo from somebody else okay. trying to infringe on it. Yeah. So it kind of spans all of that, right? And I was, I was tr- sort of thinking about it this morning. We, you know, we think about um, the uh, Inuit. Inuit, uh, we're, you know, if we think about, when I think of Ontario SPCA, I think dogs. Okay. And so Inuit definitely have a relationship with dogs. I think they're like a lot of people, maybe at the SPCA and who support the organization. Uh, there's definitely a love for dogs there. Mm-hmm. But then I think part of the difference, and like I said, I was just wrestling with it myself, is they also relied on those dogs for just about everything. Mm-hmm. Transportation, communication, you know, protection. There was just so much built in. And I think some of those things are there in, say, non-Indigenous cultures. So, yeah, that, that, that's sort of where I sort of have landed just as, I, as I've been thinking about it. Just, you know. have, have you sensed uh, indigenous perspectives on animals or animal protection mm-hmm. having changed or evolved in recent years? Um, I don't think so. I still think they hold uh, a big uh, reverence for them. You know, I think that they're still um, really uh, important to the cultures and you know, that they would still, I, I think the values would totally align with the Ontario SPCA and that they love the animals, they're trying mm-hmm. to protect them. In some ways, they're, they're you know, if I think about maybe a Western society where animals are a, a thing that is utilized, it's not, you know, it's not, um, it's not part of a, a group of sentient life forms. I think that would be the difference in indigenous cultures where it's not just something you utilize, it's part of a you know, a whole nother community. And that's definitely where I come from. We've got the sky world and the undersea world and the animal world. And, you know, there's kingdoms and all, all of that kind of stuff. So I think, um, their challenge probably when we think about, uh, reserve communities, for example, remote ones where they do maybe still have, uh, pets, they do wrestle with a fair bit of poverty. And mm-hmm. so I think, you know, if you guys are going in there and spaying and neutering and doing that kind of, they're going to love that stuff yeah. because, um, and it's not because they can't do it themselves. It's their fundings tied to yeah, indigenous resor- affairs. resources, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, you know, I've been very, uh, proud to, to be personally involved with, a, uh, one or two different different transfers of dogs from remote northern Ontario mm-hmm. and uh, it I, I have sensed a different level of collaboration and, and doors opening minds opening uh, uh, regarding working together to help communities where maybe yeah. they have a large number of community dogs yeah uh, so we will go in and do a spay neuter clinic do some uh, animal welfare mm-hmm. uh, you know uh, sessions uh, you know microchipping of animals and then mm-hmm. when we leave, 
um, be able to, to take some of those community dogs and bring them back to our shelters across Ontario and mm-hmm. help find them homes. So yeah. it's it's been an exciting, the, the evolution I have seen from the Ontario SPCA's perspective over the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah. I feel like there's really exciting work happening right now. Yeah, no, I, I think it's great. And I think uh, you, you'll be, uh, the reception will be really good overall because of that shared value, the, the caring of... Um, animals and it's not that they don't care it's just that they don't really have the resources i mean when we think about some of the really broad political issues clean drinking water and i mean they can't even afford clean drinking water it's not that they don't care about the animals they're just in the in maslow's hierarchy of needs they're just in struggling in a different area Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. i think you know for uh, the ontario spc to to, uh, show up would be uh, really supported Tell me uh, where our listeners and viewers can find information about Indigenous Corporate Training, Inc. I know earlier on you mentioned uh, different e-tools that are available uh, for for groups that are trying to establish relationships with Indigenous peoples and Indigenous communities. Where where can people find out more information? Well, you you can definitely check out our our blog and our website. So it's www.ictinc.ca. So uh, you could just type in Indigenous Corporate Training. There will be a, a navigation bar across the top, and there's actually a link there that says free. So if you want any of our free stuff, just click on that. You'll find our free ebooks and templates and stuff that people can use. We also have about 500 articles, some of which we've talked about the spirituality of animals and relationship and all of that kind of stuff. So there's plenty of uh, resources there. I would uh, be interested, you know, Ed would love to, hear from some of the some of the people that really support the organization that they're doing the research they're checking out um, the community's website itself uh, maybe indigenous and northern affairs canada mm-hmm. um, those those would be a sort of websites that you could go to as well uh, excellent with resources yeah listen thanks for joining us today bob really uh ed- interesting and educational for me to talk to you about this oh. and uh fascinating i, I really enjoyed the, my, the time we spent my pleasure it's great to be here thank you very much for bringing me in And thank you to the listeners and viewers of Animals Voice Podcast for joining us. We love getting your show ideas. You can email me at kmckenzie at ospca.on.ca. And you can find me on Twitter at OSPCA Kevin. Until next time, we'll catch you later. Hey guys, Callie here from the Ontario SPCA. Thank you so much for tuning into this video. And of course, subscribe so that you can catch our brand new videos every other Tuesday. Hey, don't forget, like, share, comment, because we love to hear from you.